Imagine a podcast episode that's all about life, all of it, the joys, the sorrows, the meals, the papas and mamas, the children, the siblings, the neighbors, the friends, doctors and nurses and herbalists and oncologists, the cooks and artists and lovers, the people you remember, the people who remember you. That's what we have teed up today on the Hear Me Now podcast from the Providence Institute for Human Caring. I'm Sean Collins. Glad you're with us. In Italy, we have a saying, in dreams as in love, all is possible. Where are you from? Texas. I came here to experience art to try things I may never get to again in my life. Mi chiamo Amy. Sei americana? Sì. Allow me to cook for you at my restaurant. I express myself through food. I get that. Why don't you want to talk about going back to law school? I want to be an artist, Dad. I want beauty in my life. It is said that Dante met Beatrice here. One of the most beautiful love stories of all time. Let's keep our eyes on the good things and the good food. I think we can be something great. Oh, we need more than love, love. Today we start our new lives together. Nothing is holding us back, only dreams ahead. Lino's reinventing Thanksgiving. Oh, good, because if there's anything Texans love, it's different shit. Are you still on that starter job? It's not been easy for me in this country. I'm a chef who can't make a living cooking for people. Lino, what happened? This is not my home. Mm. The city has no center. In a city where there is no center, I'm your center. We can do this. You did it your way, and I am proud of you. Everything we want is a gamble. I think that we can do this together. What's going on? This ain't a burden you gotta carry by yourself, son. You know you've got us. All of us. Italians love a good love story. And ours is for the ages. Mm -hmm. That's Zoe Saldana in the role of Amy and Eugenio Mastrandrea playing Lino. Scenes from the new Netflix series From Scratch. It's based on the New York Times bestselling memoir of the same title written by actor Tembi Locke, who now adds executive producer to her long list of credits. Tembi is a longtime friend of the Providence Institute for Human Caring, serving on its advisory board. And she joins me now from Los Angeles. Tembi, it's so good to have you here. Welcome. Oh, thank you for that heartwarming introduction. And I have to say, I got emotional just listening to the trailer. And I was there for all of it, for the living of it and also for the filming of it. And it still, it gets me. So thank you for beginning with, with that tone. Oh, you're welcome. The series is just beautiful. It's beautifully shot. It's beautifully acted. It's a complex human story, beautifully told. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So for anyone unfamiliar with the story behind From Scratch, it parallels your own story, traveling to Florence to study art, meeting a charming Sicilian chef, your beloved Saro, falling in love, moving to Los Angeles, beginning a life together, and then him becoming ill, and the two of you coping with his very serious illness and his death and your experience of grief. It's a story about love and loss and family and life and food. Oh my gosh, so much food. Uh, there are lots of conversations that are held over dinner tables. Yes. It beautifully portrays what goes on in a family in the midst of crisis the small moments of redemption and how we remember those moments. Thank you. There's a scene in the first episode where a mentor of Amy's in Florence talks about what Amy notices 
and how she sees the world. Let's listen to that. Se ancora un bocciolo chiuso, capito? I'm sorry. I'm telling you to look up instead of down at the paper you sketch on. Or rather, look in. I think you're going to look back one day and understand yourself in a whole new way because of the choices you're making as a young woman right now. And maybe this finds its way to a canvas. Maybe not. Either way, you'll bloom. Tembi, talk to me about the role of memory and looking back. Oh, Sean. <laughs> um, that line in particular... Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell a story uh, about that, that particular line that you played. Um, when my husband was very ill, we traveled to Florence, um, for the summer, not for the whole summer, but we traveled on our way to Sicily and I had my daughter with me and we visited some old friends and one of my husband's oldest and dearest friends. And we were in a piazza having pizza, gelato, all the things you do in Italy in a piazza. And, and my husband was chatting with someone else. And she, this woman turned to me and she said, I don't know if you know what you're doing right now. And she was referring to me being a mother and a caregiver, the fact that she was very clear that Sara was very ill at the time, but yet we were traveling abroad because we knew that that would lift him in some way. And it was in that moment, what she said to me, the how of what she said to me landed really deeply because she was suggesting that there was a time that I would look back on this moment and that I, I couldn't have full perspective right now, the depth and breadth of what, I was of what I was experiencing, but that at some point in the future, I would look back and understand this experience in a whole new way. And I never forgot that line. I just never forgot that message. And it lifted me when she said it because it, it, it allowed me to lift my gaze above the depths, the pain, the difficulties of illness and sort of hold my head a little higher, Look, lift my gaze above that and understand that life also exists and will exist beyond this moment. So fast forward to us making the series and we were, as we were writing the pilot episode and this, this sort of journey that Amy, the lead character based on me, is, is, is having. And of course, her journey with art in our series mirrors a lot of her journey of life. <laughs> and so she's asking her art instructor, like, am I good? Is this okay? Is this working out? And I labored over, as a storyteller, how to the words to put in her instructor's mouth. And I was, was in Florence when I was re, we were rewriting that scene and I thought, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, I know what it is. It is that moment that was gifted to me when someone in your life says something that you don't quite understand in the moment, but you will revisit it and revisit it. And then when I wrote it, I thought, oh, this is me talking, me now talking to my younger self. You know, if no one quite told me that in my 20s, they told me later, <laughs> you know, but to hear that as a younger person and understand that your life is going to have many arcs mm -hmm. and um, to lift your head, lift your gaze, you know, sometimes above the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can remember that, it, it's very helpful. Yeah. And, and in the way life works, you learn that lesson, as you said, you were gifted that, that insight. And now, you know, a generation later, you're sharing that same wisdom with others. I mean, it is the very nature, I think, of grieving, that we go through it, and we learn something about ourselves, we learn something about life. And then we feel many of us, I think, feel compelled to share that with other people. Absolutely. I, um, I remember growing up with, um, you know, the elders in my family and, you know, this is, uh, you know, in the late seventies and the early eighties and we would have family reunions and people would sit around the table. There was no TV. <laughs> I mean, they had a television, but it was turned off 
and they would tell stories about the quotidian events of their lives, but they were doing it in a way that was offering something up to the person sitting next to them. Like, I lived through this. I saw this. He said that. She said this. Do you know what I thought about this? Mm. And what I, I think the collective experience of that throughout my, my young childhood was it was telling me that our stories matter, that our experiences matter, and that I learned so much from just listening to them. So they were, they were doing that thing. It was kind of an oral memoir, <laughs> you know, what they were doing, that storytelling. And I think that's what memoir is. Memoir is sitting around the table or around the campfire and just telling, the, telling your nearest and dearest what you've seen, what you've learned, in the hopes that they'll know a little more about life as they go forward. Yeah, it's how wisdom builds in families and communities. Yes. You've worked as an actor for years, portraying other people. Um, what was it like for you to watch Zoe Saldana portraying a character that's based on you? It was a beautiful, surreal, humbling, uh, wild, <laughs> you know, experience and a ride. And, 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 you know, Zoe and I talked very early on in the process and I said, you know, she'd read the book, she loved the book and she was so excited to be a part of this project. And she said, look, you know, I, I want to give this project my best. And I said, Zoe, you make Amy your own, you know, the pillars, you know, the posts, you know, the guy posts along the way. I said, but make her your own. And I said, and I'm here. And so there were times when we would check in and we would talk very specifically about certain moments. And then I would watch her on set. And I, I, I just marveled at the way I assume, because it, it's a kind of an alchemy that I'm still trying to sort of unpack and understand, but that the way in which she would capture these moments, these, these, these things that were not necessarily exactly me, but it held the energetic piece that we were all looking for. And she captured that, that sometimes the, 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 as people have said to me, they said, Tembi, you have this thing of you're both strong and tender. And she captures that. And when I would see that in the scene, I would recognize it in a way as my, as a part of me. And it was beautiful. And she does an amazing job in this. And I am, I am so humbled and grateful and uh, in awe of this experience. She does do such an amazing job. Did you learn anything about yourself watching her performance? Yeah, I would say um, as we get later in the series, um, I was seeing my life in a different way. <laughs> Meaning I know I'd written about it in the book and yes, I know we'd written the scripts, but it was something very different about seeing it on its feet and embodied by other human beings. And I was seeing the embodied pain. Mm. I was seeing the embodied grief. I was seeing the embodied struggle. And it was something about watching that part of my life that is very personal that yes, I, I write about, but I don't talk about a lot because I think it's it's still very hard for me sometimes to put words around it verbally. I, I was able to do it on the page, obviously. But seeing it fully in the 3D, you know, and 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 also with with great specificity inside the interior of the home, because it, it, it touched me and it pierced my heart in a way that was sometimes difficult to watch. And I would leave set, you know, I'd say I need to step away <laughs> because it was it was landing in me in a way that was revisiting the pain, the trauma. Hmm. And also dislodging it a little bit because I was able, to, that was the gift in, in watching it also was that I was saying, okay, but I have lived through it enough and I'm safe. I'm here now. I'm on the other side of it. And um, I don't know, it was a very, it was a, a strange and beautiful gift. And I'm, 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 I'm grateful for having witnessed it. That's Tembi Locke. We're talking about From Scratch, the new series, which is streaming on Netflix. Tembi, part of the tension in the story has to do with, with privacy and medical decision making and who you tell and who knows what's going on and who doesn't know what's going on. I, I think that's a really common experience for people dealing with serious illness and the the tension of respecting privacy and autonomy 
and at the same time, not closing off avenues of support for the individual who's sick, but also for family caregivers. Talk to me about that tension. Yes. Um, in the series, we were, I, we, and my sister, who is my co-creator, and she's the showrunner for our series. And, and that's Attica And that's Attica Locke. Locke. Yes, Attica Locke, my sister, um, who was a, an amazing partner to have in this whole journey. And she and I talked a lot about that moment when the diagnosis came. So she's my sister. She was in my life. And so we talked about the ways in which what, what Sato, my late husband, asked me to hold back and not tell because he wanted to sort of process things himself. But that left me as his spouse and as his wife and now as his caregiver holding a lot because I was holding the secret he was keeping from his parents. <laughs> um, there were ways in which I couldn't, let's say, tell my agents at the time, you know, for work, like why I couldn't work because I didn't want to, you know, maybe have them think, oh, well, if she has a husband who's super ill, she's not going to be able to work a lot. So we're not going to, you know, bother with submitting her for work, you know. So I was holding this tension. So Attica and I impact a lot of that. And we decided for the series to really explore it. So Amy is holding the fact that Lino has said, I'm not telling my parents what's going on yet. Amy also isn't telling her employer what's happening. Then she's also not telling her own family. So we give her this heightened circumstance of holding all of that. And we see on screen what the cost of that, the cost to her personally, the cost to her marriage, what it, how it re reverberates out to her family. And that really is, I think, to me, it was like one of the things Attic and I were very clear was a non-negotiable in our storytelling. We had, we would have done a disservice, not only to just my lived experience, but to millions of caregivers in America, <laughs> had we not touched on that story point. Yeah. It's difficult. It's hard. I mean, I like a lot of people who are listening, I know that from personal experience that the initial heartfelt response is, I have to honor the wishes of the person who's going through this illness. And at some point, I think a negotiation happens where you say, I need, I need help and I need to be able to call people in yeah, to help exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah. And I think what's, you know, in, with, in my own life, you know, I very much, I felt like this is his experience. It's also mine, but it's his, it's, it's in his body. And I need to, yes, respect that. Um, and I was so frightened. And I think there was a fear that initially early on, and I was 31 when he was diagnosed. So I was very much, I was so afraid of the experience. And I thought if I tell it to too many people, this is this is kind of the magical thinking part of it all, which like if I it, it will make it more real. There was something about, at least in those first couple of weeks of the diagnosis, like if we just keep this on lockdown, <laughs> maybe it's not a thing. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, that's not sustainable. It's not tenable. And it had a cost to our marriage. And I, I figured out that it would, it would, it would come at a great cost to hold that secret. And you talk, yeah, you talk about the difference between privacy and secrecy. And so that's always that, you know, if people sort of conflate them, but they are sort of different. And I was trying to respect his, in some ways he wanted to be private, but I think with certain people, he wanted to keep it a secret, you know, and that felt a bridge to, that was too much to hold. I said, we can't, we can't do that. You know, it, it leads to this really profound truth that, um, at the end of life, people often have work that they they feel they have to do, that there's unfinished business. And often that has to do with relationships. And that is just so powerfully and beautifully uh, portrayed in um, from scratch. Just an incredible, an incredible performance from the actor who plays Lino's father, um, Paride Benesai, uh, full of of pride and heartache, um, just a tour de force performance, I think. Yes. Paride, uh, from the moment we watched his first audition, 
I knew that he embodied a kind and quality of paternal love that I recognized in my relationship in the relationship with my late husband and his father. And um, and interestingly enough, just side note, he did his audition tape from his Sicilian farm. I think he was standing in his olive grove <laughs> before his audition. And I thought, <laughs> oh my gosh, like it was literally um, life coming back to me. I was like, what is happening right now? Um, but his performance, you know, so, so one of the things that we really wanted to do with their dynamic, that father-son dynamic, so much of the book and so much of my story is about the repair work of family and the kinds of ways we are constantly, um, as family, lifting each other up. We disappoint each other. We come together again. We ask for forgiveness. We say, I'm sorry. We say, thank you. And there's this way in which that is very much at the core of this father-son relationship. And so in the series, Lino and his father, Giacomo, have a, they've severed, they've severed ties. There is an irreparable or seemingly irreparable um, rift between them that predates Amy. <laughs> it predates Amy, which was true to life. My husband, Sato, and his 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 father, Giuseppe, their, their fracture was predicated on a fa- a, a, the, the archetypal son disappointing the father. The father wants this for the son. The son doesn't live up to it. And it was age old. And so in the series, we knew that that had to be there. And whereas in life, that repair work between father and son took many, many years, they didn't get the gift of one deep, good conversation where where both get to just sort of say their truths, right? And then decide what to do on the other side of communicating to each other their truths. They didn't get that in life in the same way. But we knew for the series... We wanted to dramatize that and have have Lino and his father Giacomo really say their truths to each other. Because I think when we go through life and we aren't able to do that with our family members and someone isn't able to see us, witness us, hear us for who we are, all of our vulnerabilities, our strengths, it is. It it makes the way more difficult. It makes the it, it, it's harder. And so, our hope, our series shows, illustrates, dramatizes for people the possibility of what that might look like. And Paridi is fantastic in it. He just got it. He understood intuitively what we were looking for, what it called for. I think it touched on some things in his own life. And I think for Eugenio, they were so beautifully matched. And I will say that that father-son dynamic has extended off screen. (laughs) Those two, oh yeah, those two are, I mean, Eugenio is at his house in in Sicily frequently, you know, hanging out and and doing things. I think they found a bond together um, that you see on screen. That's really lovely. This is true for family caregivers. It's also true for professional caregivers that you can, that illness can take such center stage that you can begin to forget that there's a human being in the bed, not just a a disease process, right? That you stop thinking about the person and you start thinking about just the illness. And there's a moment in the series where... Um, Amy takes uh, a Sharpie uh, on the eve of uh, Lino's surgery and draws a heart on the surgical site, on his knee. Let's listen to that. Do you really think they're going to cut the wrong knee? No. It's just so they know. You're a man with people who love you. Especially me. Mm-hmm. 
when Sato had his surgery, his first surgery, I did that um, when we were in the pre-op. He was in the pre-op area. And I did it for two reasons. One, I felt like I needed, first of all, my husband to know how much I loved him before he was about to go through this. That was primary on my mind. And secondly, I also wanted a part of me, of my energetic, to be in the room with him, that he didn't feel alone in that room. And in a way by, you know, taking the Sharpie and like, right, and it wasn't a Sharpie, it was a ballpoint pen (laughs) that I did it with, you know, and writing that would remind him, even when he was, you know, under anesthesia, it was like I, his wife was in there with him. And lastly, yes, there was the work of, of humanizing him. I remember it was like something like 4.30 or like five in the morning. You know, you have to get to the, the, the hospital super early, right? right? And it's dark outside. And then, you know, you're waiting around. And, I, and he was, the surgery was, you know, um, supposed to take something like, I don't know, f- upwards to five hours. It was, it, I just felt like this day is gonna, this day could take so many turns that if I don't take this moment right now to like do anything I can as his wife and as his caregiver, as his lover to sort of put our love into this hospital bed. That was literally the way I was thinking about it. Like, how can I just like, because he's going to be separate from me. And I wanted to, to close that sense of separation. And I wanted to, for all the strangers, because we'd had our oncological team up until then, but this was a handoff from the oncological team to the surgical team in a hospital that we'd never been in before. And I was like, they don't know him. They don't know our story. They don't know us. And so, you know, and he said to me very as, um, you know, as Lino says in the series, what do you think they're going to do the wrong knee? <laughs> and, you know, I was like, well, no, but maybe they could, you know, I was like, so we're going to, I'm going to do this. And we wanted that in the series, that moment in the series, because caregivers are holding so much, right? And those moments are so tender. And I will, I hope that people will, with great intentionality, kiss and love and 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 their loved ones before they go into these moments. Because I think Sado in life felt he was able to take a breath going into this moment saying, okay, come what may, whatever happens, I know I am loved and I'm sorry, but when we, whatever big experiences we're about to have, knowing that, that baseline of knowingness of being loved anchors us. It allows us to exhale just a little bit more to feel supported. And I do feel that collectively that means something. And so, yeah, I wrote on his knee. I love you. Te amo. Te amo. Te amo. Te amo. And I think when people saw it, I do think it, I mean, people, meaning the surgical team, the, the surgeon, the nurses, that people stop for a minute. I, I think people, we all stop for a minute when we are reminded of our humanity. Yeah. How can you not? Yeah. Yeah. And I have said before, I just want to add this one little thing. I have said before, um, I remember being with, uh, a physician once bedside in a hospital. And I felt like I wasn't hearing or receiving uh, with clarity the message that was trying to be said. And so I said, please tell me what you would tell your own daughter in this moment. Just do that. Because then I'll, please, would you do, would you do that for me? And it shifted something and he did. And what he said in that moment allowed First, I got greater truth. I got greater <laughs> insight into what was happening. And I said, just let's, I understand there's a professional lane here, but this professional lane exists inside of the human experience. And so please, please just talk to me as though I were a loved one in your family. What would you say to them? Please say that to me. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Tembi, I really admire how you portray uh, an interracial relationship. Um, It pops up as an issue for people around you, um, sometimes in moments of anger or frustration. um, You're aware that it's there. Um, 
in the minds of others, but it's not the center of Amy and Lino's story. Um, thank you for saying that and acknowledging that. Um, that is true to my experience. So I wanted to be as authentic and honest in the series as possible about that. And then Attica and I talked very specifically about how we wanted to portray what it means to be in an intercultural, interracial, bilingual relationship, right? In which two people with two very strong cultures are coming to the table, (laughs) right? And that as an African-American woman in the world, I am always aware of race potentially being a factor in the room, if not sometimes the factor at, at certain, depending on the situation perhaps. But it also was never the thing that Sada and I woke up thinking about. (laughs) We just were in our love and we're in our relationship. But the way that that plays plays out in in how it played out in our lives and with the lives of our family, for example, in the series, you know, we have Amy's family who is like, well, I don't know about this. (laughs) What's going on here? And with the series, we wanted to talk about the very real thing, you know, in television and often what has been portrayed on screen is like, you'll have this interracial relationship between a, let's say a a white person and a a black person. And it's, it's often, let's say the white family who's like, I don't know about this black person. But that was not the case in my family. <laughs> the case in my family was like, the Black family was like, I don't know about this guy. Like, who is he and where does he come from? And and also his family was like, I don't know about her. She is so, you know, I always say that like, yes, I've talked about the fracture between father and son for sure. But when I came along, it was like, okay, wait a minute now. She's American and she's not Catholic. And, you know, her parents, she has parents who are divorced. Oh, wait. And she's an actress. This is like, yeah. and she's black. This is a bridge too far. It was so many things that it was sort of beyond their level of understanding and comprehension. And I think the, the fact that our families, as different as they were, were able to come together in a lifetime was kind of, a, was, was really remarkable. Yeah. And yeah. and it felt like a story worth telling where we're always aware of the specificity of our cultures, our individual cultures, and we honor that. Yeah. No one is asking someone to check their culture at the door. It's it's not a it's not an either or, it's a yes and. When you bring two cultures together, two races, two languages, it's additive to your life. Yeah, the portrayal of that is one of the real triumphs of the series. I mean, it does such a good job of portraying that that blending that goes beyond expectations. We really wanted that on screen because I think there's a healing in that. And I wanted, I wrote about it in the book and I wanted that healing to be visualized on screen. Listen, I have a daughter who is biracial, bicultural, all the things like there's so, we live in a time and a place and in the world in which that blending and melding is, 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 is happening and it's valuable and needs to be owned and the old paradigm of either or and everything is contentious, yeah. although that exists in the world and no one is denying that, this series is an invitation to hold space for something else. And for all of the triumphs in the, at the family level, there are still moments time and time again where a caregiver in a hospital will walk in and say to you, you know, I can only I can only be talking to family with the assumption that there's no way this black woman in this white guy's hospital room is family. OK, Sean, I'm going to break it down for you right now. <laughs> OK, <laughs> let me just tell you that happened to me. That was a non-negotiable. We knew that would be in the series because I write about it. I think I passed through it briefly in the book. But that happened to me repeatedly as Sato's caregiver, repeatedly down to even in hospice. (laughs) We literally had someone coming home to the home that we lived in, the home that, you know, I'm the, I'm on the title. (laughs) Like I pay the mortgage, right? There's pictures of the two of us all over the house, but the, the unconscious bias and the unconscious sort of um, starting point is that you see you see this white guy and you're like, oh, she they can't go together. And so when I was told- Who are you? Yeah, who are you? Yeah. And when I was told in the hospital, 
Um, I actually, the actual thing that one person said to me was, oh, so how long have you, how long have you worked with him? And I, I was so thrown by the question. I, I didn't understand to work with him. And then I understood what, what was being asked of me. And I said, well, let's, I'll just say I've worked with him for 20 years. <laughs> they were like, wait, what? <laughs> and I said, he's my husband. And I remember writing on the, I wrote on the uh, whiteboard in the hospital room, you know, I wrote black woman in the chair equal wife. I can't say it anymore. I can't, I cannot continue to be struggling to, for my head to, for my husband's best care for tending to his emotional health. I have a child who at home who's breaking down because she's not near her father only to then come sit in this hospital room round the clock and be dismissed or looked past or looked over. And so I just cut to the chase and I said, I said before, I said, just refer to the board before you speak. <laughs> You know, so we we tried to the degree that we could to sort of touch on that in the series because it is a very important thing, and and it's a very important thing. There there so much is happening bedside in at, in hospital rooms, all of all, so much living, so much emotion, and we br- we bring to it the bigness of the complexity of our American culture, and I get that. And also take a moment, take a breath. When you walk into the room, survey the situation, lead with love, lead with respect, lead with care. Whoever's in the room, whether they are a paid caregiver or they are not a paid caregiver. Yeah, Yeah, it's a real important takeaway for any healthcare worker who's listening to keep that in mind. I mean, yes, you're doing amazing work in cooperation with these families, but those families look, they look different. They look different. They're kaleidoscopic. Yeah. And, and our family looked, you know, there were times when we'd have lots of people in the room. Sometimes we'd have just one person in the room. And I, you know, being me, (laughs) you know, I often would like, I would decorate the room. Like I just, I was trying to sort of bring our life into this space that I understood was not a personal space. I didn't own it. You know, it wasn't, but it was ours for the time we were there and it was all we had. And so personalizing that, and I, we even put like notes on the, out on the, on the, um, door before it says, please lead with love. Like I literally wrote that on the door because I knew that, that the people doing the work and the valuable work in our hospitals are moving so quickly. And sometimes they are, tasked with a high patient load. I don't know what bedside they've been to before they're coming here. So I was hoping that just putting a note on the door was like a, like a quick little mini micro reset before you walk into this room. And, you know, that was me. There's a scene in uh, Amy and Lino's backyard um, in their garden, friends gathered informally. You can see that it's really life-giving for everyone who's there. Uh, You can see that it's tiring for Lino. And uh, because of that, it it has to come to an end. It's it's a moment of profound truth, I think, that there's this desire to experience as much as one can while one can, while one has possession of the presence of of that person, to drink it all in, um, knowing that it's going to end. It's an amazing scene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is drawn from real life. Um, Forgive me for being emotional just in your retelling of it, because I know that I was given gift of being able to say goodbye, right? It was a gift. It was a gift to be bedside to my husband. It was a gift to be able to receive palliative care, to be able to have him come home for my daughter, to be able to be with him. That was all a gift. And I know that, and I'm very aware of that gift. And so I wanted to share that gift with the world in this way, 
in the hopes that if you are so inclined and if that feels like something that is good for you, it's not a directive. It may not be right for everyone, but if it is right for you, some variation thereof, it's an invitation to consider it. Yeah. And that moment that happened for us, I still have a picture of that moment on my phone. And that, mo- that mm-hmm. moment happened 10 years ago yeah. when everyone was gathered. And it's the last photograph I have with my husband sitting up, being with all of us around him. And it, his life force, even though he was so frail and he was less than 36 hours from making his transition, his life force is very strong in that picture. Yeah. And he was really still living. And our series is a, is a lot about living, wringing as much life out of this human experience as you can until the moment you can't. And that that is generative for everyone, including the patient. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful storytelling. Thank you. It really is. The, the really fine actor... Um, Rodney Gardner plays a character who's gone through loss of a partner. Um, he's something of a wisdom character, a sort of griot, maybe. It's it's a powerful performance. And I, I think of that uh, as a role that you found yourself in personally. Uh, it's now part of your calling, I think, to speak truth about loss and grief to people who are in the midst of losing someone. Um, I'm so glad that you included that Preston character of, as a wisdom character. Um, so Preston is uh, based on someone, a, a real person in my life, um, whose name is actually, she's actually a woman. Her name is Julie. Um, and I had many friends actually who serve that role of kind of coming in at a specific moment and dropping into me an awareness that the truth of what was happening, right? They wanted to stand in the truth of what was happening with me. And I'm so grateful to those people. So when we came to the series, we wanted Preston, the character of Preston, and one of our writers, Marguerite McIntyre, who wrote episode 107, she was a caregiver herself. Uh, both to her parents, also to a very dear friend. And so she had fulfilled that role in her own life. And we wanted, and, and I understood that many of the people in my life who, draw, who gave me wisdom during my caregiving years were men who had lived through the AIDS crisis. And they knew, even though I was always like, no one else is kind of good. They were like, no, nope, no, nope, people have gone through this. <laughs> and, 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 and they would often come to me and kind of give me an awareness of what that moment was like for them. And they shared that truth. And so it was a gift to me. And again, I really believe if I can, in my work and in my time on this planet, make it a little easier for the person who comes behind me by sharing what I know, then that is a role I want to play. That is a, a, something I want to, a, a ground on which I want to stand. And Preston stands on that ground with Amy. And Rodney does that moment so beautifully on screen. And he, how he's walking her up to the end and saying, this is what the end can look like. This is what can happen at the end. And I had many people fulfilling that role, but we kind of synthesized it. We made Rodney a composite of many voices, right? So that when the viewer is watching it, they know, oh, okay, okay. This is what it can look like at the end. And, you know, I, I never walk someone up to their, to their transition. So how would I know? But now maybe the world will know that these, this is what it can look like. Tell me before I say goodbye, I, I just want to point to a couple moments. <laughs> they made me laugh. And in the midst of tragedy, there's humor. And, and I think that's important. One of them is the scene that never gets commented on, but it's a bunch of Italians line dancing 
at a wedding. My work here is done, <laughs> Sean. My work, if I do nothing else, let me tell you right now, for the rest of my life, if I do nothing else, I'm like, I have, I've, I've done something. That is such a joy to me. That scene is such a joy. It happened in real life. We had, we had like straight up line dancing at my wedding and we had all these Italians who were like, what is this? What is happening right now? Like we had R and B going and they were like dancing the earth, wind and fire or maze or whoever it was. And when we, what was so hilarious is when we were filming it and Eugenio had never, our lead actor who plays Lino had never seen this. And we were like, get in here. Let's show you how. And so I remember I was teaching him how to do it. And it's that beautiful melding of cultures, right? Yeah. It's that beautiful and it's funny and it's joyous and it just makes you smile. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. The other moment I want to point to is Amy's, the character who plays Amy's mother, who's an herbalist, um, in an effort to help at one moment, uh, start talking a concoction that has the has her brand name of Chakra Khan. <laughs> Like I stopped, I stopped the playback and, and like rewound it. I want to hear that again. I want to hear that again. Yeah, she yeah. really did say Chakra Khan. Chakra Khan. That, okay. First of all, I love, I love the character of Lynn in the series, who is, oh, who is, you know, the, so the characters based on my parents are sort of sketches, but they are blown out and they're way more dramatic and interesting <laughs> and fun than my own parents. However, Lynn is a particular character who I just love her on screen. And that moment, that, that came up in our writer's room. Um, Jason Coffey, who's one of our writers, he came up with that name. And I thought, this is the best, the best line ever. And I actually am like, I, I think someone's going to like pat, someone's going to put that on a t-shirt or do something with that because it's so great. Um, but yeah, she, Lynn is the herbalist who is, she's going to, you know, fix Lino's cancer with, <laughs> you know. <laughs> a couple drops of Chakra Khan. Yeah, exactly. It's been 10 years since... Sorrow died. Uh, I know those anniversaries kind of hit in a different way, you know, those those even numbered anniversaries. Apart from this huge creative endeavor, how have you found yourself marking the 10th anniversary? Yeah, um, the 10th anniversary this year was... It's interesting. So I can give you... There's like the sort of how I mark it. There's how my daughter marks it. And then there's how we market together. And I always talk about that sort of triad of, of, of grieving inside of a family because the child has one experience of missing the parent, the spouse is missing the lover the spouse, and then there's what you do together as a family. So for me this year, very much, we were in the middle of still editing the series. And um, I just, how I marked it was to you know, I said a prayer, I lit the candles, I visited the cemetery, which I do. And um, it held for me this year, I was very aware that I'm honoring his legacy and his energy. And there was something about being in the editing room and watching the, our life watch over us, wash over me. I felt that um, he was with me in some ways in a strong in the, the strongest way he's been over these last 10 years, he's with me right now. And for my daughter, this year, we did what we usually do, which is some kind of meal, something very, you know, uh, Italian focused. There's always watching videos of her dad. Um, and then we went to the cemetery together, which is what we, what, we, what we like to do together. So it's, I don't know, it's surreal 10 years. It, uh, 10 years is a, is a special, the, the fifth year was hard, uh, and the fifth year is actually when I got the idea to write the book because I understood the fifth year was such a milestone and it caught me off guard and it kind of fright, it kind of like startled me a little bit that I thought if I don't write some of this down, I might not remember it five years from now. <laughs> you know, you yeah. know, it, it just, the sense of time passing was so a, a little arresting for me that I felt I want to document some of this and a lot of it for myself, but also for our daughter. Um, and that, so I, when I look back, I realized it was around the fifth anniversary that I chose to write the book. And so here to be here five years later at this juncture with the series coming out is, is quite profound. And I think it's a wink and a nod from him. He's always saying, I'm here with you. I'm here with you. I'm not going anywhere. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to. My guest is in the kitchen. He's always with you, right? Always, 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 always. And, um, 
I made one of the recipes from the book, which are a combination of his recipes and and from my mother-in-law. Um, and it's in the series. It's the eggplant parmigiano in the series. And the the staff on set, the chef on set made the recipe exactly as we liked. And I was like, okay. And he said, I'm going to feed this to the actors. They have to eat it in the scene. And da, da, da. so we make this eggplant, right? <laughs> eggplant parmigiano. It's in the series. The actors eat it. And Lucia, who plays my mother-in-law, is like, who's Sicilian? She was like, can we have this to take home to the to the hotel? This is really good. Can we have it to take home? And I thought, I've done my job here is done. I have fed the Sicilians, me, eggplant parmesan, and they're into it. And they're I was like, yes. And I was like, okay, Sato would love this moment, right? He would be delighted that to this this full circle, like me cooking <laughs> for people playing, you know, his mom and enjoying it. It just was beautiful. So thank you for asking. Thank you. May we put a copy of the recipe on our website? Of course you can. Absolutely. I would love that. Wonderful. You'll find a link to the recipe at hearmenowpodcast.org. Tembi Locke, executive producer, inspiration for the Netflix series From Scratch, which is streaming now, speaks to so many truths about living and love and serious illness and families and the myriad ways we're touched by the people who love us, regardless of geography or language or culture or race or generation. It's really, really beautiful work. Tembi, thank you so much for sharing that story and thanks for joining me today. Sean, this has been a gift to me. Thank you so much for um, your your thoughtful conversation and questions, but also for um, sharing your impressions of the series. It it touches my heart because this has all been a labor of love and a labor of the heart. And so um, I thank you. I thank you. The Hear Me Now podcast comes to you from the Providence Institute for Human Caring. Follow us on Twitter at human underscore caring. The podcast is produced by Melody Fawcett and Scott Acord. We have research help from medical librarians Carrie Grinstead, Seema Bakta, Amanda Schwartz, and Heather Martin. Our theme music was written by Roger Neal. The executive producer is Michael Drummond. The U.S. Surgeon General has warned of a youth mental health crisis in our communities. Join us in two weeks when we're back with two young women, both mental health advocates with great insight and whose messages are reaching deep into the community. We're going to go out with the voice of Matteo Bocelli from the soundtrack to From Scratch. I'm Sean Collins. Thanks so much for listening. Be well. Quando penso a noi era destino che ti avrei incontrata qui senza più dirci addio Per arrivare qui oltre gli oceani seguo il tuo cuore per trovarmi a casa
Mama.